The last time we looked at the Kentru Vale, I reamed out the frame to fit a 30.9mm dropper post. My goal with this project is to take this Walmart bike and turn it into an aggressive trail hardtail. If you watched that video, you might have noticed a few things missing. In an effort to meet a deadline, I was hoping to have this bike completed by the end of the video, but there were a few complications. So what we had was an unrideable mock-up. Hell, I even installed the front tire on backwards. But now that I have everything I need, let's disassemble the bike and get everything installed correctly. Let's go back in time to the beginning of this project. Before starting the project, I weighed and measured the bike to get an idea of all the specs. The stock bike is hefty at a whopping 33.8 pounds. After disassembly, I weighed the frame, which came in at a surprisingly light 4.8 pounds. That means we have an opportunity to shave a good amount of weight. The stock Suntour fork came in at over six pounds. 6.44 pounds. Six pounds of your 30 pounds comes from this. Guarantee you we could shave at least two pounds off the bike. Welcome to phase two of this project. With everything measured up, we still need to prep the frame a little bit further. This is an example of good intentions that just didn't pan out. So really nice looking. If you look here, this port looks pretty good. But in our case, what we need to do is we need to run our rear brake as well as our shift cable. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna drill two holes here and make a, a hole within this where we're gonna fit a rubber grommet. I measured my grommets and made a drilling template that I taped to the frame. My plan is to drill two holes, then cut out the middle to make an oval hole for the rubber grommet. To do this, I'm using a titanium step bit. This seems to work better than a standard drill bit in this situation. I ground out the middle using a Dremel tool. Then I filed the inside edge to deburr it. The rubber grommet isn't the prettiest solution for this bike, but it works. Do you know what time it is? It's time to cut off this abomination. Now I feel much better. During this build, we're gonna have to swap out the fork. And we're gonna install a tapered steerer tube fork. So we'll need to replace the headset, which is adapted to fit a straight steerer fork. For this project, I went to Amazon and I picked up a Jessica headset. This is a surprisingly nice headset. The bearings look to be of good quality, all for a cost of $20. All right, here we go. This is where we either Ruin it, or we get it right. Oh man, look at that. Wow, perfect. Oh my God, I love that. I've gotten really, gotten really fond of pressing things in these days. We'll come back to the fork a little later. Next is the crank set and the derailleur. I think the stock drivetrain, which is comprised of a clutchless microshift advent setup, is fine as long as the trails don't get too rowdy. But the derailleur upgrade was a no-brainer. That's the stock derailleur. So we're gonna save that, but we've replaced it with this Microsoft Advent 9. Let's, let's put them next to each other. Virtually identical. Here's the difference. Here's the clutch mechanism. And then here, there's no clutch mechanism. So that's how you can kind of tell them apart. Uh, also, the jockey wheels are a little flimsier, and these are more robust jockey wheels. Ooh, listen to that. That's really cool. But when I went to install the derailleur, this happened. Just turns. This one, tight. This one, just turns endlessly. Which is why we had this in the last video. But of course, this ends up being an opportunity to test Kent's customer service. So I went to the website and sent in a warranty claim for the hanger. To my surprise, a new hanger was in my hands within three business days. Of course, my lack of faith had me searching for alternatives. And again, much to my surprise, I found one. A much better quality derailleur hanger from derailleurhanger.com. You can look at the difference, you can see the difference in quality. For the crank set, I relied on the reviews of many of you 
and went with an IXS crankset off Amazon. This is basically a knockoff of a Shimano Holotech crankset. The finish is not as refined as brand name cranks, but I can forgive that if they're durable. I also ended up buying a narrow wide chainring off Amazon. A 32 tooth Oronet chainring came with mounting screws and was only $12. The fork we're using is the Manitou Machete. This fork typically sells for $500, but I stumbled on a flash sale at Jensen USA, and I scored this fork for a ridiculous $269. This is a tapered steer fork with 120 millimeters of travel. It has a simple but effective damper. It's got 32 millimeter stanchions, but it's plenty stiff with the reverse arch. We're gonna use these. These. <laughs> are a little bit big for uh, this bike probably, but they are boost spacing and they have Hope Pro 4 hubs on them. They are definitely not the permanent wheels on this bike. This is for another project. I'm keeping the rear wheel stock for now, but I forgot that the machete is a boost through axle fork. So the stock wheel, which is non-boost, is not going to work. I was hoping to buy a better set of mechanical calipers, but they're surprisingly expensive. So I decided to get a set of hydraulic brakes. I was able to find a pair of Magura MT4 two-piston brakes, and they came with Magura Storm rotors. One even came with a 200 millimeter rotor adapter. That'll go in the spare parts bin. Maguras are very powerful, even their two-piston setups. And it looks like they were factory blemishes or takeoffs from a demo fleet. Watch how the fluid changes color. They either used a different kind of fluid, or the fluid was really old. Either way, I think for the price, we have a good set of brakes here. For the cockpit, I kept the stock bars, but I decided to swap the stem for this fun Funduro stem that I picked up on sale for $23 at Chain Reaction. I had an old set of ODI grips laying around, so I installed them. For the pedals, I went with a pair of Fuker pedals from Amazon. They're basically knockoffs of Race Face Chesters, and they're pretty grippy. Let's weigh the bike again. Before upgrades, this hardtail weighed in at a whopping 33.8 pounds. After the upgrades, the bike is 31 pounds. We shaved nearly three pounds off this bike so far. That's still with inner tubes and wire bead tires. Total cost of these upgrades, $549. That's more than the cost of the whole bike, which was $399. So this brings this project to $948. Oh, oh wait, I forgot. We also installed a PNW Loam Dropper and Lever in the last video. So the grand total cost of this bike is $1,163. To put it in perspective, you can buy a brand new Canyon Stoic 2 for $1,199. That's a bike that will have boost through axle frame. It'll accept a bigger tire than the Truvail. It'll be dropper ready for a long travel dropper and it's available in the size of your choice. And every part is from a known cycling manufacturer. So in the end, it seems like a waste of money to upgrade the Truvail to this level. Yeah, I'm really fun at parties. But to use a car analogy, people that started souping up compact cars like the Honda Civic were buying the cars that they could afford and modify whenever they got paid. The cost is lower and you can still drive rather than doing nothing while saving up for a more expensive car. And in a lot of ways, these budget builds are similar. What's the retail on one of those? More than you can afford, pal. Smoke. You're building up something high-end on a payment plan. But talk is cheap. Let's see if this bike performs. I took this bike out for a shakedown ride on some technical single track to see how well the bike holds up. The sizing of this frame, 
with a slightly shorter stem felt pretty good. The bike retained that in the bike feel that it had in stock form, but it was easier to move the front wheel around when needed. The extra 20 millimeters of travel did not have a negative effect on handling. The fork itself is a big improvement over the stock fork, but that's very much expected. Having an air fork with an adjustable rebound damper provides a good amount of support and improved traction. The Manitou Machete did its job in this regard. I doubt I would have bought this fork at the full price. For $500, I'd look for a used high-end fork with more adjustment, or potentially a Bomber Z2. But at the $269 I paid, this is a fantastic fork. But it was boost only and forced me to get a different front wheel for it to work. There are several decent budget forks that would be an improvement over the stock fork and available in non-boost. Forks like the RockShox Recon, the Manitou Markor, and the Suntour Epixon. This will allow you to keep the stock wheel. There are a ton of higher end used forks out there for cheap. As far as the frame itself, I've ridden more supple feeling hardtails, but I am running a little higher pressure due to having inner tubes. And I'm hoping that running tubeless will soften the ride a bit. But that's part of phase three. One issue that persists with my frame is the rear brake. I still wasn't able to completely eliminate the rub. From what I can tell, there's an incorrect tolerance on either the rear hub or the post mounts themselves. I was able to shim it slightly to get rid of the noise, but it came back after a couple of rides. In my opinion, post mounts are a bad idea on quick release bikes. An IS mount is more helpful here because you can better adjust for imprecise tolerances. I'm a fraction of a millimeter away from perfect brakes. I'll get the brake issue resolved, then we'll put some more miles on this iteration of the bike. This is what I consider the most all-around setup, something that most people would find useful. Then we'll see how far we can push this bike. I hope you enjoyed this leg of my journey. Thanks for watching. really good. <laughs>